major schools and 20 major universities uh, in these kinds of efforts. Let me just make one point, since it was mentioned this morning. These are not just prestige schools, not just the Berkeley's of the world, but they are essentially uh, schools that have shown a, a, an interest in this particular matter and have some capabilities to bring to bear on it. And that's how these schools were chosen. The examples I showed should, uh, should have put down the idea that full factory automation awaits a great deal of invention. That is not true. Most of the pieces are already available. Even in Japan, a gap exists between what is technically possible and the general implementation of computer-driven automation. So the invention is largely done. The debate is really about other issues. What is the goal of automation? What is the cost justification? What are the risks of embarking on it? The consensus is that in most cases, stable, high quality, and high process yield, high process yields, and low in process inventory are more important objectives than reduced labor costs. And I think that is a right approach. From an economic point of view, the cost of manual labor per unit is relatively flat. Fixed automation carries a heavy bond up price tag, so its unit cost declines with volume. Programmable machines, however, like robots, open up a whole new area of cost improvement opportunity at lower volumes than would be practical in fixed automation. And the more flexible the programmable, programmable automation is, and adaptable to small batches and to reuse in other applications, therefore long life for that equipment, the lower the break-even point compared to manual labor. And the easier it is to link uh, these new devices together in, in plant equipment with other controls and data processing uh, computers. So that brings me pretty much to the end. Manufacturing is undergoing a fundamental change, a fundamental change to an integrated system. It's driven by new technologies and new system concepts. To utilize these technologies is not a choice, it's a necessity. If you want to meet world competition, improve productivity, quality and cost. As a country and as an industry, we have a lot going for us. Natural resources, an educatable, experienced and motivated workforce, outstanding universities, as was mentioned this morning, and an innovative engineering pro uh, profession that has a history of accomplishments that, and that is well to remember in this hundredth year of the IEEE. But we should also remember that we cannot be smug and complacent about the future. Thank you very much. From the Institute, Harold Becker, Executive Vice President of the Futures Group, and Leonard Swern, Vice President Technical Programs of the Sperry Corporation. I think the choice of our distinguished luncheon speaker today is truly remarkable because yesterday we had a luncheon talk about physical fitness and one of the topics that was covered uh, concerned exercise bicycles and I believe that our speaker today could probably give us a word of advice on this subject because in talking to him I find that some years ago uh, he and his family uh, took a little bicycle ride for exercise. Uh, it was just from Olympia, Washington to Boston, Massachusetts. <laughs> Some other uh, very distinguished features of Senator Gorton's uh, career include uh, being in the Washington State House of Representatives where he was also a majority leader and being Attorney General of that state. Indeed, as an Attorney General, he achieved a high distinction. He won the Wyman Award as the Outstanding Attorney General in the United States in June of 1980. In the Senate of the United States, Senator Gorton is a member of the Banking, Housing, and Urban Affairs Committee, and in terms of its subcommittees, he is chairman of the Economic Policy Subcommittee and also sits on the Consumer Affairs, Housing and Urban Affairs, and International and Monetary Policy Subcommittees. He's a member of the Budget Committee, 
He's a member of the Commerce, Science, and Transportation Committee and is the chairman of the Subcommittee on Science, Technology, and Space. Also a member of the Subcommittee on Merchant Marine and Communications. He is a member of the Small Business Committee and of the Select Indian Affairs Committee. We are indeed fortunate to have Senator Gordon address us this afternoon. And just to give you an idea of how precisely he fits into our program, he is the sponsor of the Manufacturing Sciences and Technological Research and Development Act of 1983, <laughs> which uh, we think is most appropriate in fitting this morning's program, just a few minutes after Dr. Block's speech. It's now my pleasure to introduce to you the Honorable Senator Harry Gorton from the state Slade Gorton from the state of Washington. When Don spoke to me about uh, the line on my resume of, on the subject of the family bicycle trip across the country, uh, he uh, indirectly reminded me by speaking of physical fitness of uh, a marvelous insight into the way our constituents uh, sometimes uh, see us when we are in our home states. Ten days ago, at the beginning of the Lincoln's birthday recess, I had been persuaded by uh, the newest uh, member of the House of Representatives uh, from the state of Washington, you know, Rod Chandler, to run with him a half marathon on Mercer Island, a suburb of uh, Seattle. It's the beginning of uh, Rod's uh, first campaign for re-election, and he thought this would be a very good thing to do in the center of his own congressional district. Rod is both younger than I am and uh, quite a bit uh, bigger than I am, but he nonetheless uh, ran the entire 13-mile circle with me. About six or seven miles into the race, in a large group of people, an attractive young woman uh, came up and started running alongside us, uh, chatting about uh, how she enjoyed the race and uh, what she was going to be doing in another week or so. And then on about her third glance at me, she said, oh, she said, you're Senator Gorton, aren't you? And I said, yes, I am. And she looked back at the two of us and she said, is that your bodyguard? <laughs> I was, I was willing to all go on with the gag, and I said, yep, that's my bodyguard. And the woman shook her head and said, I think it's terrible the way you senators can't come home to your states to see your constituents without a bodyguard. <laughs> <laughs> and I, I really reflected on how many people felt that uh, we had done such a bad job that that was what we needed to <laughs> in our own home states. But, now we're back here on that job, for better or worse, and uh, I do wish to express uh, my pleasure at your invitation to participate in uh, the 1984 IEEE U.S. Technology Policy Conference. And I'm particularly happy that this is a part of uh, your organization's centennial. The theme of uh, this conference, uh, I'm told, uh, electrotechnology and innovation, is a particularly timely one. In fact, that theme is at the heart of the challenges facing our society during the course of the 1980s. As we meet here today, the economic news has been encouraging with regard to corporate profits, productivity, unemployment, inflation, and other leading economic indicators. But there is a shadow which looms over our ability to lead both in innovation and in productivity and indeed a shadow over our entire economic recovery. It may be only a shadow today, but in future years, as our children grow, it will come to dominate our horizon unless we deal with it now. That shadow is the huge federal budget deficit, currently representing close to 6% of the gross national product of the United States or a figure of close to $200 billion a year. 
What does a deficit of this magnitude mean for our economic recovery? What does it mean for the prospect of maintaining U.S. technological leadership in this century and in the next? First, that deficit poses an immediate threat to this economic recovery. Economic news today is good. Industrial production up, housing starts up, new orders up, employment up. But the next step in a normal recovery coming out of a, <coughs> of a recession is for business investment to take off. In the past, without exception during a recovery period, there has been a pool of savings for which business, uh, on which business can draw to finance expansion. But today, with the federal government consuming an ever-growing share of the savings pool, as a matter of fact, uh, uh, taking up almost all of our domestic savings pool, the private demand for capital will, sooner rather than later, collide with public financing demands. Yes, there'll still be some investment, but it is already being financed largely by foreign credit, and there is a high real cost to that reliance on foreign capital. That capital must be converted into dollars, thereby bidding up the dollar's value in international markets and reducing proportionately the competitiveness of American goods and services abroad. But the immediate problem is not only the adverse impact of the size of the federal deficit. There is a longer-range issue at stake for our generation's continued technological leadership and for the potential technological leadership of future generations. For 200 years, our American economy has grown because we have consistently saved a significant portion of what we produced and saved. And we have applied those savings to productive investments. The accumulation of capital has always been the key to economic growth. Today, for the first time in American history, the possibility that we may actually eat into our capital is a real and immediate threat. Right now, we're running in place. We aren't yet reducing our capital stock, but as the government squeezes private borrowers out of credit markets, savings which would otherwise finance productive investments are being used instead to pay the, to pay the government's current bills. We are consuming today at the cost of paying tomorrow and tomorrow and tomorrow. So if we, as individual citizens, as well as, as elected government officials, are truly concerned about maintaining the United States technological leadership, we must understand that the deficit is an issue to be dealt with now, lest it strangle our recovery tomorrow or next year. There is no avoiding this challenge. It is the immediate problem facing the country today even in an election year. We must deal with it, and we must deal with it with real dollars. Deficits will not fall to <coughs> sloganeering about waste, fraud, and abuse in government programs, but only to real spending cuts and to real tax increases. And all of your reflections uh, on policies and on priorities have got to have that in mind to be realistic. At the same time, uh, even at a time of austerity, there are specific things which government can, should, and must do to aid industry and the private sector in maintaining its competitive edge, for it is, after all, uh, production uh, and prosperity uh, which is the base of the very tax system and the social services system which this government provides. First, I'm convinced that government can and must continue to support research. I was pleased to see this year that the administration's budget proposal, which Congress will undoubtedly enhance, calls for an increase in funding for basic research of about 10%. I think that it is critical to continue su to support basic research as an investment in the future but at the same time to recognize that it is almost certainly going to have to be paid for out of other programs uh, which have grown much more rapidly in the past. Simply to say, however, we must support basic research is insufficient. 
What the research system needs from the federal government is not only support today, but stability and predictability of support for tomorrow. We are all aware of the incompatibility of the long-term nature of basic research and the annual nature of the budget cycle. Results have been documented. The inadequate state of many academic laboratories, generally low salaries, and frequently obsolescent instrumentation. It's time to address the need for a stable multi-year commitment of funding for basic research. Not an easy task, given the nature of the federal budget cycle. As I've already noted, funding for research means funding for state-of-the-art instrumentation as well. The obsolescence and deterioration of university research equipment has report, been reported by the National Academy of Sciences, the National Science Foundation, and by other organizations. In this regard, I strongly support the proposed 22% increase for instrumentation support at the National Science Foundation this year. In fact, I have just come to you from chairing hearings on the National Science Foundation's budget for next year, fiscal year 1985, and the entire focus of today's hearing was on research, instrumentation, and supercomputers. As you may imagine, the issue of a possible Japanese lead in supercomputer development uh, was discussed vigorously by panelists at the hearing. Perhaps the most important task the federal government must address, along with states and local governments as well, is the critical shortage of scientists and engineers. While the importance of adequate technological resources cannot be overstated, the most significant factor in our nation's ability to lead the world in innovation and productivity is the human factor. Across the United States, there is a growing awareness that the next generation of Americans lacks the scientific, mathematical, and technological skills needed to enable it to contribute to its maximum potential. Without those skills, individuals cannot hope for a decent life, and our nation cannot hold its lead among tough international competitors. Without that skilled workforce, economic recovery can only be marginal and short-lived. The public sector has the lead role in supporting research and in ensuring a supply of technically qualified personnel. But industry, I'm convinced, has a role as well, both in terms of individual corporate investment in research and an industry's growing number of cooperative research programs with universities and even with other members of the private sector. We have seen some significant and encouraging progress in these directions, and we hope to encourage further participation. For example, the Senate Subcommittee on Science, Technology, and Space, which I chair, has held a series of hearings across the country on legislation which I and other members introduced last year designed to encourage joint university industry participation in research into advanced manufacturing technologies for all sectors of industry. I was pleased to see that the National Science Foundation's new initiatives for 1985 include a similar proposal. Imitation is obviously the sincerest form of flattery. While not a substitute for federal support for research, there is an important and exciting potential in the involvement of industry with research universities. University industry cooperation demonstrates that technology transfer is real and that the number of fields in which university research can be translated relatively quickly into improvements in productivity or product lines is increasing. The benefits to industry and the academic community from the exchange of information include not only the research but also the training of the next generation of scientists and engineers. Finally, industry deserves and needs to be motivated and nurtured by government policies which encourage cooperation. Although I am not a believer in tax preferences generally, I have come to believe that the Congress should extend the tax credit for research and development costs, but I'm here to point out to you that it is highly unlikely that that proposal will be dealt with in isolation, but only as a part of a package uh, designed to reduce budget deficits for which it will be uh, the sugar coating to what may be otherwise a somewhat bitter pill. All of you here today know, as I do, that investment in research does not yield to that investor alone the full benefits of the research. 
As a result, the incentive to invest in research is diminished. The R&D tax credit provides a mechanism for the federal government to encourage investment without at the same time attempting to pick winners and losers. In addition, as you know, legislation is pending in the Congress to clarify the impact of the antitrust laws on joint research and development efforts. It is essential that the intent and spirit of the antitrust laws to promote competition not be circumvented by anti-competitive behavior packaged or disguised as joint R&D. At the same time, we must continue to promote private investment in research and development because the federal government alone obviously can't do it all. I'm convinced that wise and helpful legislation on this subject can be passed by the Congress this year. I'm sure you are all aware of a study just released by the National Academy of Engineering on the competitive future of the United States electronics industry. That study emphasized the continuing and indeed growing importance of the electronics industry to the security and prosperity of the United States. The report called for many of the steps which I wish to emphasize to you today in summary. First, fiscal and economic policies which will ensure a climate in which industry can, can be innovative and productive. Second, investment policies that foster a steady flow of capital for new ventures as well as for expansion and modernization. Third, policies to ensure adequate research and development by and on behalf of American firms. And fourth, education policies designed to develop the engineers, computer scientists, and technicians needed for tomorrow's society. The IEEE's history has been a distinguished one. From the inception of this organization in 1884 as the brainchild of Thomas Edison, Alexander Graham Bell, and others, to your position today as the world's largest technical professional society, IEEE's history is one of participation and of leadership. You have been a strong voice for your membership in speaking out on the future of American industrial innovation, productivity, and international competitiveness. We in the Congress need you to continue with that voice and that leadership, and we need your wise counsel. I thank you for the invitation today, and I understand that we do have a few moments at least in which I will attempt to answer any questions which you may have. Thank you. because these lights are right in our eyes, well, I'll start out here from this point on. If you'll stand up, I'll be able to see you better, particularly if you're behind the lights. I'm curious to know why there's no outcry in the country. As the money markets develop and people pull money from the stock market, well, we get support for industry. If you go to the money market where industry has to pay more, which reduces the value of the stock, then it becomes a degenerative effect. The question has to do with uh, the impact and the lack of any public outcry on the